Thank you, Sunghei. Thank you for everyone organizing this. And thank you for all the people listening in. I will try to speak very slowly today and share a few ideas with you. The uh, translators, thank you. Uh, please follow my words because I have changed many of the slides. So just relax. Let's have some fun and let's talk about some of the important ideas in the diamond and jewelry industry. First of all, I want to say a few words about values. Now, we are moving to a world of values, which means that the purpose of a company can no longer be just make money. The world now is that you must have a framework of values and within those values, you make money. The issue is not just things like blood diamonds or things like money laundering. We are now in a new world where companies are expected to be socially responsible. Certainly in the jewelry industry, where we are selling emotional value. The idea of having values is fundamentally important as new generations of consumers who are more socially conscious enter the marketplace. We'll talk about Corona, how it's impacted the world, but we must understand the foundation upon which we stand even before Corona. And that is a shift in social values and how people want to buy. We know people wanted to buy using more internet, but COVID has now exploded this idea of digitalization of business, not just diamonds and jewelry, everything from how we work at home, from how we treat our children. Everything is changed by coronavirus, but it's good to understand upon which we stand. And the first point I'm going to make is we stand on our values. Rappaport stands on the values of ethical, transparent, be, be open, competition, encourage competition, efficient markets. So those are our values. And within those values, we make money, we do business. Everyone can have their own values, but those values should then be the foundation of your business. They should be the um, framework of your business. Look, we are in incredibly changing times. We are seeing more change in this year than we have seen in decades, maybe in a century. And when you have such change, such turbulence, such waves, you must have solid values that you have like a North Star to keep you on track. The Rappaport Group is involved in four primary areas of activity. Information, like the price list, the website, RabNet, electronic trading network, with approximately $6.5 billion of diamonds listed every day. Auctions and trading services and quality control and grading services. So these are the things that we do within the context of our transparency and competition and ethical and efficient values. Okay, what's happening with COVID-19? What are we facing? Is it all over? Will we return to the way things were? The answer to all those things is we are now going into a different world, a completely different world. Unfortunately, the cases and the deaths globally are very, very heavy and disturbing. We are not out of the woods yet. The situation hopefully will not get worse, but it doesn't look to be getting over very soon. Now, the impact of Corona, it's 
different types of things happening to us. First of all, physically, subconsciously, all of us are feeling this fear. Now, we must understand that perhaps in Korea, the way in which coronavirus is impacting is not so strong. But in America, it's strong. In India, it's strong. In China, it's coming out, but it's still strong. So the first thing is, when we think about corona, we think about our physical health. We think about our danger to our physical bodies. And this creates a subconscious fear. We don't even are aware of it sometimes. Sometimes you see riots in the United States. You see demonstrations. You see things happening because underneath we are having this insecurity, this anger about what's happening to us and our physical fear. The economic impacts are huge. Everything about coronavirus is, is changing everything about our economy. On one hand, we have a complete disruption in the supply chains. For four months, people in India did not manufacture diamonds. India manufactures about 93% of the world's diamonds, and the factories were closed. Now, there's good sides to this, but they were closed. It stopped. And then the stores couldn't open. So the demand side was also stopped. It's as if the whole world was stopped. The world stopped turning almost from an economic perspective. And then governments flooded the markets, the financial markets with liquidity. So we have a very strange new economic environment with an important stoppage of what happened. Socially, as human beings want to communicate, we've also had some changes. We're no longer socializing as groups and communities, and instead we're becoming more individualized. And of course, there's great political change. Now, <clears throat> the idea of fear and physical, I've explained that, but let's think about this idea of lockdowns and isolation. And what we're seeing also are contradictions in what's happening to us. Contradictions. On one hand, we have to isolate. So we go away from our friends and our others and our restaurants and our bars and our parties and our weddings. We go away from that. So we're away from people. On the other hand, we are intensely with our families. Parents are living with their children for the first time. Husbands and wives are now spending tremendous amounts of time together that never happened before. So on one hand, we're away. and the other hand, we're together. And so the bonding that we see as people has become extremely intense. And this may have an impact on jewelry demand as gifting replaces travel. And emotional bonds become more important and clearer. So there's a world of change happening that's contradictory. Look at the, econom the economics of this. It's crazy. On one hand, we see a huge amount of money coming into the world economy. Stock markets are crazy high, huge, boom, boom, boom. At the same time, we have a lot of people with less money, significant unemployment that we haven't seen in decades. This differences, these changes, these contradictions are creating a very difficult world. We must understand that. It's so much uncertainty because you see things that are very different. For example, I mean here, Wall Street is one way and Main Street is another. A tremendous contradiction in what we see, how we will sell, how we will buy, who we will do business with, who our customers will be for luxury products. There's a schism, a break in what was going on. It doesn't mean that there are not opportunities. There are opportunities now, maybe even more than before, but there are different opportunities in a confused and contradictory environment. 
So here's an example, right? What do I mean when I say Wall Street one way, Main Street another? Here's simple. We see unemployment gone to 13 million from 5.8. Unemployment shoot it up. It's come down, but it's still very high. It's more than double. And at the same time, look at the stock market. Zooming upwards at the same time that unemployment increases. How can you have an increase in unemployment and an increase in the stock market? Only because governments in their attempt to solve these economic challenges of the corona have flushed money, so much money into the market. Another factor here is globalization. Before, the whole world was one market. So you could manufacture in China, and two weeks later, you had it in your store in the United States or in Korea. But now the supply chains have changed. And not just the, the, the trade war, say, between the United States and China, or even now between India and China, not just the uh, political friction, but the logistics of how people travel and how people buy. So everything is going local. And so the idea of globalization and even global wealth is shifted. So our world has been changed by coronavirus in fundamental ways. It's not like a light dusting. It's an earthquake from the basis and the bottom of our business. Now, if we look at what's happening, and I guess I'll show you this slide, you know, so what happened? How do we get here? What's going on in the diamond industry? So first of all, demand went down because the stores were closed. Everything, unemployment, uncertainty, stores. Supply went down because the dealers were closed and the factories were closed. So we had this drop in demand, drop in supply. By the way, it helped prices because there weren't too much goods. Now demand's starting to increase. And now supply is increasing as the factories start opening up and the stores start opening up. So now the question is going to be, what's going to happen to diamond prices? And so the answer is, it depends on demand. If the factories produce more goods than there is demand for, prices will go down. On the other hand, we might see a situation where prices will go up because of two reasons. One is demand will increase. There might be this movement toward luxury jewelry. And I'll explain some other factors related to marketing. And also, I think that there might be more profitability in the diamond industry. And if there's profitability in the diamond industry, people can spend more money on demand and they can find new ways to sell new customers. Now, let me stop for a second here. Translators, are you okay? Am I talking too fast? Is everybody comfortable here? How are we doing? Anybody want to say anything here? Sung here, are we okay? It's pretty okay. Are we okay, Sung Hei? Everything all right? Okay. Now, we need to understand also what happens, and I'll show this slide again, but we saw this drop in demand, and look at what happened in the first half of year of 2020 against 2019. And you'll see later, I'll show you that, in fact, you know, we had problems even before we went into the coronavirus. But in the impact of coronavirus, mining companies, 53% less sales. Indian polished exports, 54% less. Makes sense. Less mining companies, less rough importing, less polished exporting. And India is 93% of the world production. Polished imports into China were 60% less in that first half. And, you know, so you say, well, China's over. But the United States only started experiencing this in March, April. So I would expect that the decline in sales that you saw in China will continue to America. So America will also show a great decline as we talk about maybe the second and third quarter of 2020. And large retailers, a 37% drop. And I'm talking about companies like uh, Chow Tai Fook or Signet, etc. So... We have seen a real slowdown, not even a question. And you got to understand also 
that when you talk about the diamond business, if the stores sell 37% less, they may be buying 100% less because they have inventory to sell. What is a good thing is that coronavirus, because of the stop in production, is clearing out inventories, which is supporting prices. Theoretically, there's less goods around. We used to list almost uh, seven billion, six point nine billion dollars on RapNet. Now we're at six point five, and I think that basically in the markets we are seeing a lot less goods. I mean, it's certainly the goods that are in demand. And now this graph shows you an interesting story, because we can see the blue line for 2019 those diamond sales. And as you can see, things were not so good in September also. Last year, there were problems last year. But we can now see this orange thing going a little bit up, down, and up. That's what I'm saying to you. The diamond markets went down, and then the diamond markets are starting to pick up again. Hopefully, we will see a better market in the second half. For the Now we're already in the fourth quarter of 2020. But don't count on it being too hot or too high shortages are the key factors that are supporting diamond prices. Now, the increase of supply we just showed you, but let's think about this. Will prices be stable? What's going to happen to diamond prices? So the first thing is that diamond prices will be stable. We have seen increasing prices because of shortages of supply. And now the question is going to be, what will the increase in demand be like? The United States is 50%, maybe even more now, of global diamond jewelry demand. So what's going to happen this Christmas? How much will they buy? And how much will the supply be? Will there be a balance between supply and demand? Another issue is, and we'll talk about this, Coronavirus has brought us a wonderful opportunity, more than one. But one of them is that rough prices went down. I showed you a few moments ago, right? Rough prices was 53% in the value, but rough prices have come down significantly, maybe 20%, 10%, 20%. That means there's room to make money. So if we don't drop the polish prices, if there's shortages, and rough prices are cheaper, people can make money. And if people can make money, they can market. When I say people, I mean diamond manufacturers and diamond dealers. So there's an opportunity to make profit in our industry. And if you're making profit, that's good. On the other hand, if you drop the polished prices because the rough is cheaper, then the industry doesn't make money and prices come down. So it's really up to the diamond and jewelry industry not to be commoditized flippers. Because if the manufacturers flip diamonds because they are under financial pressure because of banks, etc., then it's like making money, like flipping hamburgers at McDonald's. There's no money. But if there's no pressure on the diamond manufacturers to buy rough because they stop, if there's no pressure to pay banks back, because in India now they say that they don't have to pay the banks back right now. Then the industry can breathe. They can take it easy. They don't have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing and manufacturing, which means supply can be kept reasonable in relationship to demand. And if that happens, then we are in an industry that makes profits. And so profits are important because it allows for a gap and it allows for prices to stabilize. Now, these are uncertain times, and now more than ever, people need to see prices. Oh, there was big protests against Rappaport dropping prices. I feel sorry for people, really. I feel very bad for diamond manufacturers who confronted this coronavirus, and we dropped prices 7% uh, when the stock markets were down 35%. You know, I feel sorry, and I feel bad, but the bottom line is we need to reflect reality. So where are diamond prices? How can you track diamond prices? What kind of diamond price information is out there? Now, we have basically the Rappaport price list, which is a benchmark price. It's a price that everybody discounts for. But what are the discounts? How high are they? What's going on? 
And so we now have the RAPNET price list, which is based not on my opinion or benchmark price, but it's the actual prices of diamonds offered for sale in the market. So with 1.2 million diamonds listed every day at $5.6 billion, $6.5 billion, you know, we can actually give you that information. And so this is an example. The Rappaport price is default is $18,500. RAPNET says to you, the average price of a default is 14930 below, and the best price for a default is 12006 at 32 below. So what we're doing now is we're pushing out more diamond price information, including showing you the interdealer discounts. Now make sure you understand that these discounts reflect cash dealer prices. And so if you're going to be a retailer and you're going to say, well, I need it on memo, I need it on credit, I need service, I need to return it, don't expect to get cash dealer prices. Because anybody that is servicing you in the industry is going to have costs involved with that. And so you need to understand something. You're not going to make money in the diamond business by screwing your supply, by squeezing everybody. We're going to make money in the diamond business by adding value, by taking a diamond and doing something more with it so that it's worth more so that we can capture that value. And I think that what we're seeing now in terms of how to make profit, if this industry makes profit, we will grow, we will prosper. If this industry does not make profit, then diamonds will go down the toilet. Let's say that again, slowly, clearly. If this industry makes profit, we will grow. We will prosper. We will make money for mining companies. We will make money for poor people in Africa. We will succeed. If the diamond industry does not make money, diamonds will go down the toilet. That's what I think. So what is it? So what is it? What is it with these profits? So you have to understand where we came from before Corona. There was no profit in this industry. Everybody was squeezing everybody. Why were there no profits? Because rough prices were too high. And there was too much production, even though rough prices were too high. And even though the polished diamonds that came out of rough was worth less than the rough, we still produced too much goods and increased the supply. And there was no generic market. It was like we, we were riding off of last year's momentum, over 10 years ago momentum. No marketing means no profits. Everybody, please understand that. And so the diamond industry was doing lousy. This is 2019. Rough sales were down 23.3%. Polished sales were down 15.5%. My friends, this is before Corona. This is going into 2020. Not a good situation. And this difference, the blue line was rough. The orange line was polished. So look at that gap. Ridiculous. You had to be crazy to manufacture diamonds. So why did they? And this is what I was showing you, the mining companies and all this stuff now. So why did they manufacture diamonds if the rough was too expensive? What was our past situation that we now need to get rid of because of the coronavirus? First of all, people have high bank loans, particularly in India and particularly among manufacturers. And rough, rough costs were high. And the inventory, we had to keep huge inventory all the time because the jewelers said, I don't want to buy for cash, send it to me on memo. And polished prices were low because no marketing, no demand. But the companies needed to keep running. They needed to keep the business going. So if you were a diamond manufacturer and rough prices were high, you still bought the rough because you needed to be in a cycle where you would pay for the rough. You would pay the bank back. And if you stopped, your business went bankrupt. You were in a situation where you simply had to keep manufacturing to keep the business, to keep the employees, to keep the credit lines. If you stop buying rough, the banks would say, give me back your money. So you were in the situation where you had to keep running. 
this is what it looks like or it looked like. You're like a mouse running on a treadmill. Get the money for the banks. Get the money for the roof. Get the money for the inventory. Sell the polish. Who knows if you're going to make profit? You weren't based in a profitable business. Now look at that mouse. Do you know how hard it is to get off a treadmill? It's almost impossible to get off a treadmill. If you stop, the treadmill goes and you fall on your head. So what are we going to do? How do we get out of it? And here, coronavirus stopped the treadmill. It's the greatest gift to the diamond industry. It got people to the point where they had to stop buying rough. They had to stop manufacturing. They didn't have, they still don't have to pay back their debt. So that resulted in a situation where for the first time in a long time, the diamond industry could breathe. They could stop. They could actually think about making money. At the same time, reduced supply supported the price level. So prices went down and then they came back up again. So manufacturers can get off the treadmill. And if manufacturers get off the treadmill, what that means is, is that the dealers can make money too because they manufacturers don't have to squeeze the last dollar. So only rough quantity and price that enables profits. There's an opportunity now for this diamond industry to become somewhat normal. Now, if people are idiots, specifically, if manufacturers are I put it, idiots, they kill themselves, they pay too much for the rough again, maybe they'll go bankrupt. Maybe Corona will clear them out. But if they're smart and they don't buy too much rough and they don't pay prices for rough that's more than the polished, then the industry can return to a new equilibrium, a new stability, a new world of diamond profits. So in the past, it was lousy, horrible. But as we go to the to corona future, even with corona, there's profit opportunities because of lower costs. There's lower rough prices, lower interest rates, and better marketing that allows us to sell emotional value. Now, I'm going to show you that one of the good things is this thing called the Natural Diamond Council, www.naturaldiamonds.com. And this Natural Diamond Council is being supported by the mining companies who have finally, and maybe because of corona, woken up to the reality that they have to market diamonds. Very important. And I want to show you a little bit about how these people are thinking. Because remember, you're not going to get rich by lowering your costs, by squeezing your suppliers. That is not the way you as individuals will get rich, and it's not the way that the diamond industry will be successful. You will get rich by adding value and particularly adding emotional value to diamonds. So what are these guys doing at this, this Natural Diamond Council? And actually, the first time I think that these mining companies are doing something realistically good. So I'm going to play this. It's only 30 seconds. True connection changes you. It inspires you to dare greatly to love fearlessly, to soar. Our moments, our stories, they belong to us for moments like no other. I'm playing it again. It's only 30 seconds. Look at it. True connection changes you. It inspires you to dare greatly, to love fearlessly, to soar. Our moments, our stories, they belong to us for moments like no other. So what's going on here? Are these people selling diamonds at the cheapest price? Are they selling diamonds? What are these people selling? Is there an emotional value to diamonds? Now, what they're saying is that diamonds can attract a new generation of buyers by being stylish, by following trends. Look at this. 
this is a new trend of multiple necklaces. And you're going to see it among movie stars, and you're going to see it. And this isn't created necessarily by the Natural Diamond Council. This is a trend of multi-layered necklaces. This is a trend of horizontally set rings. Now, this means that there's new and interesting and different things happening. And there's a ride to get onto. And so you guys are listening to me today, you jewelers. Start thinking new and different. And start thinking about how you can add value to diamonds. So marketing is the path to profits. Trends in fashion for a new generation of consumers. Are you new and exciting? Your stores, your people, your manufacturers. What are you doing with those diamonds? How are you adding value? Who needs you? Those are the key questions about profitability and the future. Yes, coronavirus, no coronavirus. To a certain extent, it doesn't make a difference. Are you a commodity flipper or are you an added value merchant? That's the bottom line for your bottom line. Now, there's stuff happening around us. We don't have time. I got to shut this down. But there's a new type of consumer who's socially responsible. New customers with new values. There's a new world coming out of this coronavirus. Social responsibility is important. New digital jewelry presentations. Everything and everyone is going digital. If you have jewelry but you don't have good images of it, you can't sell it. There's new ways to buy and sell. Everyone, but to buy these trading networks, these e-commerce platforms, this connectivity with diamond manufacturers and suppliers. And there's a new importance of brands because in a world where people are buying things online, they want additional information, not just about what is the product, but who, who is the product, who is selling it, what are the values of the person, what's the reliability of that person. So it's not just brands in terms of adding value, it's brands as a necessity to be able to do business. You must brand yourselves. People have to know who you are and they have to know your values. So we're in a world of great change, great challenge, and great opportunity. There's waves, like in the ocean, waves. And these waves are not necessarily just on the beach, they're, they're up and down and back and forth. And you need to think about what are you going to do with all this uncertainty and change. The fundamental thing you need to do is understand and create diamond desire, like that video that I showed you. The idea of trends and the idea of fashion, the idea of style. I mean, you know, it's what does your customer really want? What are they really looking for? And they want an emotional gift that makes a statement about themselves, about their values. You have to know how you add added value. What are you doing to make those diamonds more valuable as they move down the distribution pipeline? Define your brand, and your brand is a promise to your customer. What is your promise to the customer? Is that you're going to always keep good value? Is it that you'll have reasonable prices? Is it that you'll have good design? Is it that have your good style? Is it that you will know what the new and interesting things are? Is it that you have good social responsibility? Whatever it is, define yourself, define your brand, and define your products. So don't fight the waves. Don't say, no, I can't deal with all this. Don't run away, although you may want to retire. Surf the waves. Use the energy of the waves to have a good time surfing. Move with the waves. Embrace change as an opportunity. There's an, a tremendous amount of change now, which means there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. And, you know, they once asked Steve Jobs. They said, Steve Jobs, can you predict the future? And he said, of course I can. How can you predict the future, they asked Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs said, and by the way, I think Apple was the most valuable company or the second most valuable company in the world today. He says, I make the future happen. I don't sit here, just get whacked by waves. I go out there and I make waves or I create things or I am a creative person. And I think that that's really the lesson that coronavirus is giving us. Our industry is a new opportunity to rewrite the book. We can go after the marketing. We can go after the added value. We no longer have to be captured by the mining company's high prices. 
We're off the treadmill. We can breathe. And if we can breathe and we're smart, we can make great profits. Thank you very much. That's it. Questions? Thank you very much, uh, Martin, for uh, exciting you know, talk. Your talk is always <laughs> very uh, you know, influential and then kind of uh, uh, you know, people to think about, about the market, about the future, and, and so forth. Okay, so um, this, you know, here, uh, most of the audience uh, for your talk is from Korea, but it's about 200 uh, participants are listening, and then about 30 uh, audiences from other countries in Asia. So not just Koreans are here. So it's good to, good to know. And then uh, questions, uh, it's about uh, uh, what do you think of um, uh, now you know, all the markets are down everywhere, but uh, you mentioned that uh, China is coming back, right? And then U.S. market is about, still it's going to be about 50% of the diamond uh, market or diamond buying market. Yeah, I think that the United States will still be the most important diamond market and it'll still carry about 50% of demand. China is coming back, but not in the same way. Not in the, you know, it's like people are more conservative and careful. When you think about China's um, and, you know, health insurance situation, there is no health insurance in China, really. And so people are saving more than they used to. And when they save more, they buy less diamonds and stuff. So even though China is starting to return, don't forget, you had a 60% drop in the first half of sales out there, imports. So you're seeing some changes in China. I think the recent arrest of these numerous smugglers has also slowed down the business. So I do think that China is going to be okay, but it isn't necessarily boom times yet. There was an initial jump, but... It's not a boom time. And I think America will keep plodding onwards. Also that America's got a very strong baseline, whereas you know, China's a lot less. So I would consider that America is gonna continue to be the, uh, say 50% of demand. I think that we'll have to see what those exports from India look like. Because if we're, if we're looking at it, you know, that's how you can really measure things by watching polished exports from India. And so, you know, I, I still think that America is going to be a very, uh, is going to be the key market that will cause prices to fall or not. Got to watch American demand. And don't forget, America buys a broader range of diamonds. Now, Chow Tai Fook has been expanding in China into third and fourth, you know, tier cities. So that's right. important too. But in general, uh, without America, the diamond business is screwed. Mm. Okay, so then um, uh, you mentioned that uh, India uh, to reduced the productions. The, a lot of factories are closed. Uh, so this is from a company in Korea who uh, deals with uh, a lot of uh, mellies. So compared to the uh, other larger stones uh, or the mellies, do you know the, what kind of uh, productions are there? Uh, or, kind of a volume was reduced for Mali in Mali production in India? There, there was a significant reduction in Mali creating shortages. Um, what happened was a lot of the workers, you see the Mali is being cut a lot of times by less expensive workers, apprentices, villagers who work in the uh, Surat industry. And these independent villagers, a lot of them, they get paid per piece. Um, they went home. They went back to their villages. They left Surat. So there was a sharp, sharp drop in the production. And the factories are coming back up, especially the bigger factories. But they're not the biggest producers of Meli necessarily. They've come back to about 60%, I would imagine now. But the Meli production has been very low. Now, what we experienced, we are also running these auctions for Meli. Uh, we sold, um, oh, I guess about $7 million of Meli two weeks or three weeks ago in, um, and we sold them to Indian companies in via an auction in Dubai, mostly Indian. And we saw a price increase of about 8%. Mm. 
-hmm. And that's because of shortages. So the Melly markets are tighter than they are. And this is inexpensive Melly. Well, you're talking about things for about $150, $200 per carat, you know, stuff like maybe $300. And so the the Melly business is now definitely harder hit with shortages because of the production environment in India. Okay, and really no one else produces Melly other than Indians. Mm -hmm. um, but therefore, I think that demand prices are stable and even a little better. I don't know that how quickly this will return to the previous levels because you're dealing with a social issue in India with people living in their villages and saying, I don't want to go back to, you know, I don't want to go back to Surat. So I imagine it's going to take some time. And certainly after Diwali. Diwali is next month on the 14th. So maybe a week after Diwali, we'll start seeing more. But people need to eat. People need to make money. Uh, so they will come back to Surat. But it should be clear, India's coronavirus situation is still increasing. And there are, you know, there are problems in India. And as a matter of fact, anyone travels to India has got to go into two weeks of isolation. And there's concerns about, you know, factories. So take time. It'll take time. It'll take time. Which I think is a good thing because you can now be more careful about how you use your melody. You can now find ways to add value. It means diamonds are more precious when there's less of them around. So if you're a big uh, Korean importer of melody, start thinking of how you can optimize the value from the melody you have. Okay, Treat it as something that's not just like easy to get. I see. All right, thank you. And then uh, there's another question that from the other company uh, is asking, um, now the... Uh, all the diamond prices came down a little bit, and then now it's going back up, as you said. And uh, what do you think that the price will be gained more? Under one carat, around half a carat, or is going to be uh, larger than one carat, or three, one to three carats? Price is going to well, increase? Well, th there's different markets. You know, we talk about diamonds as if there's one diamond market. But actually, there are different diamond markets, as this question is pointing out. Now, China is a very strong buyer for better quality GIA certified and, I guess, NGTC certified diamonds underneath the carat. And so that is a very important market for the better quality goods under the carat. And I think that market has been stable. We saw a big increase or, or better prices for half carators, 30 pointers, but certainly half carators. And then that calmed down. So I would say over the past, well, the 30s were really hot a few weeks ago, and then they've kind of calmed down. The 50s are still good, okay? Um, but again, we're not seeing the trend is no longer upward trend, but it's a nice price, and it's a little bit better. Now, the under quality, under half carat, under carat goods in the lower, in the higher or the better qualities will be very dependent on China. It's a Chinese story. The lower quality goods under the carrot is a very big U.S. story. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the designs and you look at all the stuff that are being put out there, a lot of it is dealing with melly and smaller stones. If you saw that heart-shaped ring with lots of melly in it. So we're going to see a lot of demand for better quality melly as well. But I think that the highest quality certified melly, or not melly, but certified uh, diamonds under the carrot is going to be a Chinese story. The lower quality IJK, SIs, and stuff like that, I1s, is an American story. Now, very interesting. Remember I showed you that there's two markets. There's the Wall Street market and the Main Street market. Rich people, poor people. Rich getting richer, poor getting poorer. Now, those rich people are buying diamonds, bigger diamonds. You see that in the auctions. The deflawless has gone and increased significantly maybe a 10% increase in those diamonds, maybe even 15%. And so we're seeing a movement towards high quality big diamonds, sometimes as investment. But we're also seeing people saying, I want a big diamond. You know, the, the families, they're together, the husband and wife, they have money, they're not traveling. They'll buy a three carat stone. I was just dealing with someone who was buying a three characters, uh, I, uh, VS ones, VS twos, SI ones. You know, so there's a market out there that is emerging, which is very good among the wealthy class for diamonds, and not just investment diamonds, but big diamonds. And then, of course, you've got the craziness of the auctions. Christie's and Sotheby's auctions has been making some high prices, but it's an uneven market. It's choppy. 
like wavy. So, you know, I think that if you've got some bigger stones, you know, they probably are okay, but watch out for an increase in supply. Demand can be very thin for the bigger and more expensive diamonds. It's even thinner now, maybe because of uncertainty. And, you know, not everybody who is rich is getting richer. You know, a lot of companies are shut down. A lot of stores are out of business. So, you know, you got to think about what you have. And if you can sell, you should sell at a profit. Um, but I don't think this is a good time to speculate in the bigger stones. It's an okay market for now. But if the supply increases significantly, it could be a very difficult market in the uh, months ahead. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there's another question about, about on the diamond value. Uh, you said this is time to make profit and so forth, and then by doing it, create desire or add value. So uh, this is, uh, is adding value is like a, the, the old slogan, like a diamond is forever. That uh, is almost similar like that. Could you... Please give us you know, some kind of advice or examples of to how to add value to the diamond. All right. First of all, you got to consider your market. Now, what these, the first thing we're seeing is that the mining companies have come to the realization that they have to support generic marketing. Now, marketing is essentially an idea. Marketing isn't like building a factory. Marketing is like having ideas that emphasize the emotional value of your gift. So think about that, right? These marketing guys that the Bears give us $20, $30 million, and they're going to spend $20 million between now and the end of the year promoting their ideas of trends and multiple necklaces, horizontal rings. Go to the website and you'll see. Now, the idea that you can make money by giving something new and interesting to your customer who has money. I don't think you can sell a lot of diamonds to very poor people. That's the key. So when we talk about marketing, what we're really talking about ideas that make the diamond more attractive because they fulfill a certain desire among your customers. Now, mm -hmm. you know, you can try to push diamond prices on. But that doesn't really work. That's what they've been doing with the rough and all that. But you can pull diamonds with creating demand. So if you want to know how to add value to diamonds, think about how you can make your customer happier. It's all about the customer. What does your customer want? Who are your customers? Do you have customers who want something? What do they want? Sit down with your customer. If you're a Korean jewelry store, say, well, what would you really like? You know, many years ago, I went to a very fancy dinner in, uh, in Belgium, the, the, one of the best restaurants in the world, apparently. And they, I asked them, you know, because I'm kosher, I said, do you have a menu? And they started laughing at me, and they laughed at me. And what happened was the chef, the big white hat, came to the table and he said, Mr. Ravaport, what would you like? Amazing, the restaurant would make you anything you wanted. There was no menu. What would you like? That's the relationship you have to have with your customers. Think about what they would really like, but don't just think about product. Think about their emotional context. A woman comes into the store, she's going to get married. Talk to her and say, well, what did you really like? What can I make for you that's something special? And, you know, stop. I would say also transcend the product to the customer. Stop thinking about pushing product. Start thinking about pulling in customers, relating to customers, being different, being unusual not being boring, okay? And so if you can find some differentiation points in terms of what, not only what you're selling, but how you're selling. Are you using the internet? Are you using social media? Are you using Instagram? Are you putting attractive pieces up there? Are you watching what other people are putting on Instagram? Okay? How wide is your view? Okay? And the wider your view, the more customers you can interface with. And look, the coronavirus has created a new digital world. And the digital world has no boundaries. It doesn't have time boundaries. It's not like your store is only open certain hours. It doesn't have geographical boundaries. You could only send in Seoul and not in some other town. It doesn't have product boundaries and design boundaries. You can offer all kinds of products. So play with the new environment 
to think about how you can make customers happy. And that's what you got to be. Th Don't think about how you can sell diamonds. Think about how you can make customers happy. Okay. We have to s start, you know, rethinking and all that plan ahead. Uh, one more question. I think this will be the last one because of the, uh, that we already uh, passed the, uh, the time. Uh, what do you, th you talked about only the natural diamond market. What do you think of the future or the uh, status of a laboratory grown diamond market? Now uh, Chinese and other countries are producing uh, more and more of all these uh, laboratory grown diamonds. I think that's interesting because they are in fact producing more and more and they will produce more and more until these diamonds lose value. The key question is, why is the person buying a diamond? Is the value consideration important? Or are diamonds like flowers? You know, you just, they're not expensive, you buy them. Now, at some stage, the price of a diamond isn't, you know, the synthetic diamonds or the lab-grown diamonds, they don't have the ability to hold value. And then, in other words, you keep manufacturing them and manufacturing them and manufacturing them, and it'll go the same way that synthetic rubies, synthetic emeralds went. And I don't know that the price difference between the Swarovski crystal and the synthetic diamond will be that big after a while. So yeah, I think that Swarovski's got a great business. They sell stuff. Is it a diamond business? No. It's still a good business. But the Swarovski crystals compete with natural diamonds? No. And, and the key question is, when you look at diamond demand, why is the man buying the woman that diamond? And why is the woman happy to receive it? And does that have something to do with value? Is the value of something or the ability of something to retain value, is it important in terms of the diamond gifting? And that's the key. If it's not important, if people are just buying flash for cash and they don't care and it's just like some other thing that they're going to tchotchke, that they're going to throw away or something, you know, then synthetic diamonds may be able to do a lot more and take away market share. But if it's something of value, consider a pocketbook. Okay, women love pocketbooks. And they pay a premium price for authentic pocketbooks that retain their value over time. You could probably buy a, 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 a similar looking pocketbook that's mass manufactured um, for very, very cheap. Yet people spend tens of thousands of dollars, women, on pocketbooks that are rare, that are, um, and, they, and they keep value. Those pocketbooks are, can be around for 10 years, okay? So that's the idea to think about. What are you selling when you sell a diamond? Are you selling the diamond is forever to the extent that the value is forever? Or are you simply selling the short term, you know, slam, bam, thank you, ma'am, here it is kind of thing. And, and I think that we need to sell it. In other words, we need to sell the idea of value with the diamond, okay? And the other guys can't sell value. All they can do is sell a little flash. And I don't know that that flash is better than cubic zirconia or anything else. And I, I just want to say, man, I don't like what's happening with synthetics, but it's natural. You know, people go for the cheap shot. And as I opened this discussion today, and I said, values have values. If you sell a consumer a three-carat synthetic diamond for $20,000 or $10,000, and then they come back three years later, and they say, will you buy this back for me? And you say, well, it's only worth maybe $500 now. What kind of person are you? Are you taking advantage of the customer who doesn't realize that the value of these things will go down as manufacturing goes up. You need to love your customer. You need to protect your customer, which is why they're going to you. And one way you protect the customer is making sure that they know. If you're going to sell a synthetic diamond, make sure they know this thing can be worth peanuts in a few years as there's unlimited manufacturing of the product. All right. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. So, I anyway, know we already went over time. So uh, we have a few more questions, but I think we have to stop right here. Thank you, Martin, for jo joining and giving us uh, uh, you know, your wisdom and your insight in the industry. I know you had to wake up so early because of the time difference. You were in Israel and uh, we are in Asia. So anyway, thank you so much again and uh, hope to see you soon in, in person, right? Okay, bye-bye.
Bye.